Hi, Dan Dickens here, pastor of Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. Welcome to our Bible study time. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious and loving God, we welcome you into our thoughts and reflections today. To ponder you is joy. To be aware of your presence and steadfast love fills our hearts overflowing. Teach us to be still and to know that you are God. Teach us to live in your presence, in your light, and by the grace you give us in Jesus. May we be children of the light. For we pray in your blessed name. Amen. So, we are in Psalm 16 and Psalm 17. That's what we're going to cover today. And I have the NRSV. You may have a different translation, which is always good to have uh, different translations of the um, original Hebrew that we see when we read the English. In Psalm 16, it begins as a miktam of David, which is a direction to the choir director. Again, remember that psalms were sung in the temple. So usually at the beginning, uh, it either says a prayer of David or some kind of instruction uh, when these psalms are sung, how to sing them. So it goes, a miktam of David. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I, ha I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, let's get right down to it. So when we take a look at the opening lines, uh, Protect me, O Lord, for in you I take refuge. If you were to classify this psalm based upon that first line, what would you call it? Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. To me, I would, I would call it as a, uh, a prayer of uh, request, a plea for, for protection, uh, for refuge. Sounds like someone who is a refugee of some sort. Uh, they have gone quite possibly into the temple itself to seek God's divine protection. How many times have I en entered the church, entered into the sanctuary and felt God's protection surround me, whatever bad day I'm having, and realize I'm not alone. I have God uh, with me, despite all the stuff out there, that all the troubles, the worries, the nits and picks that are bothering me. Or it could be uh, that I am in serious trouble, either by health or by someone who's out to get me in one way or the other. Maybe uh, someone who's de demanding more money than I have, or or, or is, is trying to sue me for something I didn't do. Who knows? Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, and that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Now, that seems a little confusing. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Um, or rather, it seems all too obvious. But the first Lord, capital O L O R D. Uh, is the RSV's way of using the term for the divine name of God, which is um, Yahweh. So I say to Yahweh, you are my Lord. Does that, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. I have no good apart from you. The psalmist is saying, I'm not sinless. Any good that I have is, is straight from you. And he goes on, as for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble. And noble here, the word, the Hebrew word, may better be translated as 
saints. Uh, in other words, the the congregation of the upright, the 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 fellow worshipers of Yahweh of God. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. In other words, he he places his uh, fortunes with those who worship the God of hosts, uh, Israel's God, in whom is all my delight. There is no other, in other words, there is no delight apart from this God. Those who choose, in verse 4, those who choose another God, little g, multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. In other words, as the psalmist, I will have nothing to do with their God or how they worship their God. I will not participate in any of their uh, acts of worship. When they pour out blood offerings to their false gods, I will not have any part of it. Um, or take their names upon my lips. The false, for me, I read it as the names of the false gods uh, I will not take upon my lips. Verse 5, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Uh, my chosen portion and my cup. Israel was given a chosen portion, their uh, the promised land of Canaan. That was their portion in this world. And when I hear, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. For me, I also think, um, I imagine being very hungry uh, or very thirsty either way. And I have been given the cup that fills me, my, um, my chosen portion. And how fortunate am I that my chosen portion is the Lord. In the Lord, I am full. My cup, as the psalmist in another chapter says, my cup runneth over. So here, my portion, it is more than, than what I can imagine. Uh, more than being physically hungry. I have chosen the good portion, the God portion, and I am filled. You hold my lot. In other words, you hold, um, you know, the expression, my lot in life, that uh, square footage that is where I reside. Uh, you hold that, Lord. And then it goes on uh, using that same imagery. In verse 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Remember the, uh, the Oklahoma land rush, 1889, uh, where land was made available. They, the desire was to get uh, people to move out into the Oklahoma Territory and to uh, make a home there. So they offered free land and the, uh, the land rush of Oklahoma was on and people were racing out to, uh, to stake their claims. And if they got to a piece of land first, they could stake their boundary lines, and that was theirs. And then they would uh, go and uh, re have it recorded, and that was forever theirs. Well, with with that kind of idea, the boundary lines in verse 6 have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a good leaf heritage. God has staked out the boundary lines of your lot, and that lot is uh, some, it is a metaphor for uh, for where God is going to plant you in a pleasant place. It's, it's something that God has initiated. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage because of God. It goes on. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me it's interesting, my heart, the, the Hebrew word literally for heart is kidneys. Uh, so I guess it's good to have good kidneys. Uh, but uh, think, think heart, even though it may uh, literally say kidneys, uh, we probably best understand the metaphor of, of the heart. 
I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before him because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So the Lord is uh, that great communicator when we lay our heads down on our pillow at night. And, for, you know, have you ever had a bad night and you, you lay your head down and your mind begins to race all the things that you, that have happened that you really didn't have a chance to work through during the day comes flooding back to you at night and it takes the longest time for you to go to sleep because you're, you're, you're trying to work things out or you're troubled by something that happened during the day. Well, here, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. So when you avail yourself to the Lord who can counsel you through this, and sooner or later you will find rest, the rest that God can provide. Uh, also my heart instructs me. Keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. When, one, when you and I keep the Lord ever before us, uh, I shall not be moved. In other words, I'm not going to be shaken up by uh, the things that happen in life. And then he moves in verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, my body also rests secure because the Lord gives me counsel in the night. When I would otherwise be troubled, the Lord gives me counsel. Therefore my heart is glad. My soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. Now, what began in this psalm as a, a plea for protection is now becoming nothing less, nothing short uh, than a, an affirmation of faith, confidence in the Lord. Therefore, my heart is glad. My soul rejoices. And my body rests secure. I'm getting a good night's rest. And not just a good night's rest, but my my body, my life, I feel secure because the Lord is with me. The Lord gives me counsel. For you, in verse uh, 10, For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. What does that mean? Well, to, Sheol was uh, the abode of the dead, where, where you go after you die, in this um, psalmist reading. Or let your faithful one see the pit. The pit where your body uh, degrades. And that may be confusing because you and I know that eventually we're going to die. All of us are, are mortal. Nevertheless, the psalmist says, for you do not give me up to shale or let your faithful one see the pit. So that could mean one of two things or both. Uh, maybe this one, at this point, the psalmist is taking delight that the Lord has delivered him from uh, what seemed to be death, certain death. Uh, maybe he had a threat to his life or his body was ailing and, uh, and he saw the deliverance. But I think it's, uh, it, it could be that uh, his, um, his life is continuing, but it could also, I think, be reference to a firm conviction, an affirmation of faith by the psalmist that even in death, uh, the Lord is not going to abandon him. And indeed, in the international, New International Version, that uses the word abandon. You will not abandon me. In other words, you will not give me up in death. Uh, I can go to the grave knowing that thou art with me and that uh, God and life go hand in hand. I don't have to worry about my life, even if I die. Uh, God and life go hand in hand. Now, the, some have uh, said, well, that's a, that the psalmist is talking about the resurrection, talking about Jesus. And we have to be careful. On the one hand, the, the psalmist, uh, the, the writer of that day, really didn't have a concept of resurrection the way we as Christians understand resurrection. So we don't want to put those words into the mouth of the psalmist and say, that's what he's talking about. Nevertheless, as Christians, we can see how the words of this psalmist 
find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, who uh, died and rose again, and who uh, was very familiar with this psalm and trusted his life and his death on the cross in the God of life. And although Jesus uh, died, uh, he was not abandoned and left there to rot. Uh, you did not let your, your faithful ones see the pit and didn't, didn't let my life just rot away. No, you raised me. Uh, we can say that uh, through Christ, this confidence of the psalmist takes its fullest meaning in our confidence in the resurrection of the dead. It goes on, You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And when it says, in your presence, this is verse 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy. It literally reads, fullness of joy um, in your, within your face. Yeah, fullness of joy um, is with your face. That's what that means. And <clears throat> the literal words, in other words, when I stand in your presence, when we read uh, face, think of God's presence. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In, in the face of God, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's sort of a uh, parallelism, Hebrew poetry, of saying the same thing again, but in a little bit further explanation. So by staying with God, by sticking with God, sticking by God's right side, uh, we will find the kinds of pleasures that only God can give, even when faced with death, beyond death. Beautiful, beautiful psalm. Psalm 17 reads, Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me, they close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They track me down. Now they surround me. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground. They're like a lion, eager to tear, like a young lion lurking in ambush. Rise up, O Lord. Confront them. Overthrow them. By your sword, deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals, by your hand, O Lord, from mortals whose portion in life is in this world. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. A beefy psalm, if you ask me. Here it begins. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. So it's a, a cry that psalm must be delivered. Hear a just cause. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. I think it's important for us to understand what the psalmist is saying, but the psalmist is not saying here. The psalmist is not saying, I am sinless, free of sin, I have never done anything wrong. It's not what the psalmist is saying. He's not advocating that he is uh, sinless in general, but rather that he is sinless in particular. 
what he is being accused of in this particular case, he's saying, didn't do it. I'm not, I, I am innocent of this. So that's important for us to understand what the psalmist is saying, what the psalmist is not saying. Elsewhere in the Psalms, uh, the psalmist will uh, loathe in his guilt over something and pray for God's uh, forgiveness. But here he's uh, taking his case to God's court and saying, God, you know my heart, I'm, uh, I'm not a sinless person, but of this accusation, I am. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. From lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right on this, on what, what I'm bringing to you. It goes on, if you try my heart in this matter, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you'll find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. Search me. And you'll see. As for what others do, by the word of their lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. In other words, I'm yours. I'm, I'm yours, God. I've, been, I've walked in your ways, not the ways of the violent. It goes on, I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Lean down, hear my words. Wondrously you show steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge. What a wonderful way of describing who God is. O Savior of those who seek refuge. Mm. I can imagine at the entranceway into the temple or the entranceway into any sanctuary of God, those words. O Savior of those who seek refuge. And then we enter into that building. We have sought refuge and found it in the Savior of those who seek refuge. From their adversaries at your right hand. Now, from your adversaries. The word adversaries here in verse 7. The Hebrew word is literally risers. From their risers at your right hand. Of those who seek refuge from the from their risers, in other words, from those who rise up against them, those that are at your right hand. And then here's the key verse, verse 8. From those people, those risers, those uprisers against me, guard me as the apple of the eye. In other words, that, that wonderful thing that we see, ah, an apple, mmm, tastes so good. You're the apple of my eye. Um, guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. So you can imagine um, God as a protecting bird coming down and cupping God's wings around the psalmist and protecting the psalmist from any harm that may happen. We have seen uh, images of birds that would enfold their wings over their, their chicks. That's the, the symbol of this. Guard me as the apple of the eye, as if I am your apple. Um, hide me beneath the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. Now he's, uh, he's addressing, uh, well not addressing, but he is explaining, describing these these wicked, they, they despoil me. They, uh, they would make me rotten if, if they had their way. Uh, my deadly enemies surround me. They close their hearts to pity. They have no care, no regard for me, as I know you, O oh Lord, do. Their mouths speak arrogantly against me. They track me down. So it's as if he's being hunted down. Now they surround me. Again, he's saying, uh, surround me twice, so he must really feel like he is pinned in all around. It's a frightening situation. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground like a lion eager to tear, like a young lion lurking in ambush. 
this psalmist is faced with pretty bad enemies, frightening, terrifying enemies. And then in verse 13, we see the connection earlier in verse 7. O Savior of those who seek refuge from their risers at your right hand. And then in verse 13, rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. So those that would rise up against me, you, O Lord, rise up against them, confront them, overthrow them. Uh, deliver my life with your sword from mortals whose portion in life is in this world. And that's interesting, the way he's describing it. From mortals whose portion in life is in this world. You remember earlier in the 16th Psalm how good it was that our portion, that our cup, that our lot was with the Lord. That the Lord is our, our lot. And how pleasant the um, place is because of that. Well, here, those enemies of the psalmist who uh, is innocent of whatever it is they're accusing him of and surrounding him and threatening his life, um, God is to rise up uh, and that their, these mortals, their portion in life is not in in God, but in this world. They have chosen their lot, and it's a worldly lot. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them, for those who have chosen a worldly portion. And what do you think um, are the things that their bellies are filled up, the things that God has stored up for them, for those that are ungodly and who falsely accuse and who would uh, kill God's own. What is their belly filled with that God will store up for them? I think of judgment, God's justice. It will not be a pleasant place for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. On the one hand, I, I don't. Uh, there is other scripture that says that the uh, the sins of the father will not fall on the sins of the, of the children. Uh, other places, the consequences of one's uh, wickedness have effects on the family. Uh, negative effects. So maybe that's what the psalmist is talking about. May their children have more than enough from what you have chosen in this, uh, in this world as your lot. Um, it affects them too, is what I, I get at least from this. And then in verse 15, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. This is another image like Psalm 16 where the psalmist is asleep and hoping that when he wakes up, trusting when he wakes up, that he will be satisfied because he sees the face of God. And maybe not literally, not literally the face of God, but he realizes that he stands in the presence of God. And uh, that's enough for him to, to know that in his lying down and in his rising up, he is satisfied. He has more than what he needs. Uh, he has chosen the good portion, the God portion, not the portions of the world that his enemies have chosen, the risers, uppers against him. Psalms of deliverance that turn into psalms of affirmation. Both of these psalms. And isn't that the way it is when we turn our troubles over to the Lord? When we come into the house of worship troubled by uh, a troubling week, uh, difficult things that have happened, either our own illness or troubling events happening in the world or in our lives, we take it to God, we turn it over 
to him. And even though others may be falsely accusing us, we know that God sees all the way through and knows our our hearts, uh, hearts and our kidneys, and realizes that, uh, the psalmist realizes that when when he turns this over, God will deal rightly. I will stand by, I will be sheltered uh, under the wings of God, I will stand by the right side of God, uh, and I can go to bed and I can wake up knowing that it's okay. I'm with God and God will take care of me. I may not be sinless, but I can take my case to God and God can see all the way through this and know what is the truth and that in this regard I am innocent and that I will continue to strive to walk in the ways of the Lord. Great, great psalms of uh, pleas for deliverance that turn into affirmations of faith. As we go out of our worship and as we go through this day, may whatever we pray to God for uh, move us from requests to affirmations of faith, knowing that God not only answers our prayer, but gives us a goodly inheritance. God bless you in this day. May it all go well for you as we turn to the Lord, trusting in Him. God bless.